Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. Yes, we all have a fate, we all have a destiny, but our destiny is created how? When a lot of us think of, oh, it must just be my fate or it must be my destiny. It's as though somehow my destiny was written in some very random way thousands, millions of years ago, somewhere in the sky and totally disconnected from me and this life in this body. It's just, there's my, there's my fate and it's, there's nothing I can do to escape it. But that's not, that's not where our fate comes from. Our fate comes from our karma. So our karma, the word karma actually means action. When we think of karma, we usually use the word karma to mean the fruits of our karma. So we would say bad karma, good karma. But that's more of a Western colloquialism. The word karma actually means action. Now, whether you are studying physics, Newton's laws, or you're studying spiritual laws, either way, Actions have reactions. Actions have consequences. Actions have repercussions. Plant a peach seed, you will get a peach tree. Spill water on my sari, it will get wet. Actions have consequences. Share love. You get love, not always from the other person. Because, of course, their whole karmic package is involved. But if you share love, you feel love inside you. Even if the other person can't necessarily respond appropriately. But if I'm creating love and sharing love, I'm feeling love. So everything I do is going to have a a consequence, a reaction, a repercussion. There will be what we call fruits of the karma. Now, if you add up the fruits of all of my past karmas, past lives, this life, all the ones that have not already borne fruit, because some of them are immediate, what we would call kriyaman karma, it's immediate. It's not something I need to carry into a next life. I spill water on my sari, it's wet. Then it'll dry. End of story. But a lot of what we do bears fruit later in this life. Some of it bears fruit in next life. We don't always have the results of an action immediately. Your fate is the sum of all of the fruits of all of the actions you've done that have not yet already borne their fruit and finished. So your destiny is created by your actions. I always say the pre of something that is predetermined, right? We say oh, it must be predestined, predetermined. The pre is right here, right now. My action here and now is the pre 
of that which is predestined for me next week, next month, next year, I am, if you could turn destiny into a verb, you would say I am destinying myself right now. Right? I'm, I'm creating my destiny through my actions right now. So that's karma and fate or destiny. And then God's will. God, as far as my experience, as far as the wisdom that I have received from enlightened masters, from scripture, God's will is one thing and one thing only, that we should realize God. That we should realize self, whether you say self-realization or God-realization. That is what God wants. God is not sitting there having a will about whether you're going to get a particular raise or you're going to get a promotion or you're going to get into a specific university. I mean, it's from a spiritual perspective, it's very helpful. Psychological perspective as well. It's very helpful to be able to simply say, it must be God's will. It, it, it's a perspective I fully support because what it does is it keeps you really calm, really peaceful. It keeps you accepting the universe. Then we're not fighting the universe. Oh, this project didn't succeed. Okay, it must be God's will. It's a beautiful way to live. But it also involves this idea of God as much more of a micromanager than I actually think God really is. That which happens, happens due to wide varieties of intersecting factors. Our past karmas, our karmic journey. Other people's karmas, their karmic journey, because we're all intersecting together. You get a raise, well, someone gave you that raise. It's not your individual karma in a vacuum. Someone had to decide you deserved that more than the other guy. The other guy has a karma, a karmic thread, a karmic journey. All of them are interweaving together to create a situation that is both a result of past karmas, not rewards and punishments, as I always emphasize, just simply a result, but that is also the most conducive situation for you to do the one thing which is God's will, which is to realize God. And so when you realize that everything that happens is happening for a divine reason. And that's why I love people who say, and I even say it, I try to say it, I try to remember to say it, it's all God's will. Even though if you actually pinned me to it, I would say, eh, I think probably God isn't wasting his time, you know, deciding that I'm not going to make it to the dinner because there's too much traffic. Like chances, chances are God was really not so personally involved in my traffic jam. But, but what, it, what it means is it's all in the will of the divine unfolding. When we say God's will, it sort of personifies God like God has a vested interest in. I should make it to the dinner. I shouldn't make it to the dinner. But if we realize it's all just part of this divine unfolding, that of course, God, the divine, the capital P, planner, whatever we say, has put into motion. <coughs> but it's happening along with laws of nature. Karma is one of those laws of nature. There's a lot of other laws of nature. 
And all of our unfolding, it's like my favorite example of this is gravity. Gravity is a law of nature. If I walk to the top of a building and I step off it, and it's a tall building, well, regardless of how high it is, I'm going to fall. If it's a tall building, I'm going to splat on the ground. Now, was that my fate or destiny? Was it written thousands and thousands of years ago that I was going to die by falling off a building? I don't know. Not in my mind. In my mind, that's a result of karma. I've done an action, which is I walked off a building. Maybe I did an action before that. Maybe I got really drunk. Or I took a lot of drugs that led me to believe that I could fly. Or that led me to think that the building was just right there off the ground. And hence I stepped off it. But when I did that, it brought me right into an intersection with a law of nature. And that law of nature is gravity. Now you say, is it, was it my destiny to die? Well, it became my destiny to die when I did the karma of stepping off the building. Or when I did the collective karmas of getting drunk, taking drugs, going to the top of the building believing what my drug-induced mind told me about the height of the building. Those sequential karmas created a fate that when they intersected with gravity, a law that was put into place with creation, I was going to die. Now, do you say, was it God's will that she should die? Well, no. God just put this law of gravity into place. Was it God's will that I should go against everything I had learned about maintaining presence of mind, maintaining consciousness and mindfulness and awareness? No. God just put this thing called the law of gravity into place when, when nature was created. So we intersect our actions with the laws that have been put into place by the divine creator. And if we are in alignment with God's one will, which is we should realize God which means, of course, as we do that, that we experience love in ourselves as ourselves, that we share love, that we experience light in ourselves as ourselves, and therefore we share light, that we realize and recognize the abundance of ourselves, and therefore we share of ourselves with others, that's God's will. That which happens in our life, depending on how aligned we are with God's will, is going to be an intersection of my karma, the laws of nature, and God's will. But hopefully we allow God's will and our alignment with it to be that which guides my karma, my action, so that I'm acting in accordance with my higher goal, which is self-realization, God-realization. And then you find that your life becomes something where you're always just saying, oh, it's God's grace. It's God's grace. It's God's will. It's God's grace. Because that's what's unfolding for you. Rather than constantly going, oh my God, I guess this is my, my bad fate. My bad fate. My bad fate. Align the karma. And then what you'll see is whatever 
the destiny of the moment may be, you're going to be able to use it as a way to further your deepening awareness. And then God's will becomes your will. And then it's all just, as Pooja Swamiji would say, by God's grace. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. No, the title of my of my book is Hollywood to the Himalayas, and I've had so many people say, "Really, you're from Hollywood?" And yes, literally. And it's a world where everyone wants to be an actor, an actress. And what makes one person get a role, another person not? It's an absolute enigma. There's no equation. I mean, there's some similarities. You've got to be nice looking. You have to be at least mildly talented. You have to be driven. But beyond that, there's no set of skills. I mean, I know people who are incredibly skilled. They've taken lots and lots and lots of acting classes, programs. They're great singers. They're great dancers. Never got a job. And then out of the blue, some, somebody who, you know, isn't nearly as objectively talented becomes a star. There's no equation. And this isn't true only in places like Hollywood. This is true around the world. Now, there's some professions that do tend to be much more rooted in your actual competency than in who you know. Things like technology, things like science. I mean, you've got to be able to actually do the work. Doesn't matter who you know. If you're hired from some big tech company and you can't actually code, they're not going to keep you for very long. But along with having the competency... Having connections is also a great benefit. There's lots of people who are super competent. Lots and lots of people graduate with software engineering degrees every year. They don't all get great jobs. So as a teacher, what I would say is help your children, your students, use everything that they have. Help them understand that, number one, they have to work hard. They have to have the skills. Because even if they know someone, if it turns out that they are incompetent, nobody's going to hire them or keep them hired. So they've got to have the skills. But if it turns out that their family knows people or their neighbor is somebody or there's... Why not? You know, a lot of times I'll hear people say, well, 
I don't want to use a connection. To get this, I only want to do it on merit. And to me, even if there is a connection, if there's not merit, they're not going to hire you. You're not going to actually succeed on connection alone. You have to have the ability to do whatever it is that you've been put in the role to do in order to succeed. But if it turns out that you happen to know the right people or you could meet the right people or you could make a connection, you could network, why not? It's yet another skill. If going to a conference and spending time meeting people in the field that you're interested in, networking, why not? So I would, as an educator, I would help them do both. Help them understand that no, mommy's or daddy's friends are not going to actually be able to make them succeed throughout their life. They may be able to open a door. They may get them an interview where otherwise they wouldn't get them an interview. They may get them a low-level starting position where otherwise they wouldn't get that. But they're not going to carry them to a position of success. And in the same way, to deny meeting people who could help you also doesn't make any sense. That's also a skill. That's also a tool. So encourage them to do both. You know, being, being the type of person who people want to work with is in and of itself a skill, you could call it, right? I mean, nobody puts it on their resume, but if through networking, let's say I'm, let's say I'm an employer and I've got a job opening and there's a hundred resumes on my desk, all of which look good, like every person who has submitted a resume has got the skills because otherwise the people who gave me the resumes have cleared away all the people who don't have the skills. The ones now on my desk are people with the skills. But then I find myself at a conference and over a cup of tea I'm talking to someone who it turns out also has the skills and I'm really enjoying the conversation. And this person really strikes me as someone who is enthusiastic, sincere. They're funny. They make me laugh. Turns out we have a lot in common. Why am I going to go back and waste my time going through a hundred resumes? I'm going to hire this person on the spot. So help them understand that both are skills, the skills they get in a classroom and skills of how to, how to get along. You know, it's the, it's the drama of this world of Maya. You know, we all, we all have to play our role. And so if a piece of your role is to have a certain profession or to go in a certain way, play that role. Play it fully. Nothing wrong with that. And that's why, you know, as an educator, you could also help them. A lot of kids get really nervous. They don't know how to talk to adults. They're told and taught from childhood that children are meant to be seen, not heard. You know, shut up until I speak to you. So you put them in a job interview and they freeze. They mumble a great skill to give them. Run mock interviews, run mock communications. Interview each of them in front of the class. Get them developing communication skills as well. Because that'll really, really help them in life. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. 
Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Thank you is the best mantra. Most of us think that the order should be first, I get what I want. Then when I get what I want, I'll be happy. Then when I'm happy, I will be grateful. I mean, that seems like a logical order. Here's what I want. Until I get it, I'm not happy. Then I get it, I am happy. And in that happiness, I express my gratitude to whoever gave it to me, to God, to the universe, whatever. But actually... Actually, it turns out that it's not that happiness leads to gratitude. It's actually that gratitude leads to happiness. And it's not that getting what we want leads to happiness. We know that. We know that. I mean, how many, how many times in life Right? There's that great story of the, the villager who, what did he have? He had a cow? Forget the first part of the story, but join me in the middle of the story where he's, he gets this horse. Out of the blue, this beautiful horse shows up. Something very bad had happened to him before then. And people had said, oh my God, you know, you've lost so much and you poor thing. And he said, we'll see. We'll see. Then he gets this horse and everybody says, oh wow, you're so blessed. You've got this beautiful, beautiful horse. And he says, we'll see. And one day his son is riding the horse. And the son falls off and breaks his leg. And everybody says, my God, your beloved son, your one and only son, broke his leg. My God, you poor thing. And he says, we'll see. And a little while later, the government of the city that he's from comes through pulling all of the young men to fight a war that has started with the people in the neighboring city. But his son is laid up with his leg in a cast. And so his son doesn't get taken off to fight in the war. And everybody says, wow, wow, what a blessing. Your son got saved. Of course, he says, we'll see. Right? So we all know the situation of getting what we think we wanted, only to discover that actually it wasn't nearly 
the blessing that we thought. Sometimes not getting what you want and realizing in retrospect, oh, thank God, like not getting it was such a blessing, right? We've all had that happen. You prayed, you wanted something, you didn't get it. And you realize later, my God, if I had gotten that, where I would have been. So we know that getting what we want is not the way to become happy. But we also know that gratitude at its deepest level is not that which stems from actually getting something that makes me happy. Gratitude stems from an awareness within ourselves of how blessed we are, regardless of what we have, of how deeply blessed we are. If your eyes open this morning and you actually can see out of them, if you've got legs that enable you to stand on them and walk into your bathroom from your bed, if you can turn on a tap and actually have water come out of it, clean water that you can use, to drink, to cook with. If you've got food in a cupboard, on a table, in a fridge, or money in a purse to be able to buy the food from a market. If you've got someone in your bed when you wake up, or in your house, or in your life anywhere, who you love and who loves you. Not necessarily romantic. Anyone who you love who loves you. If you've got all of those things, you are more fortunate than almost anyone on this planet. And if on top of that, you can worship God however you want, without some government, some group, some people preventing you or oppressing you or killing you? If you can love other people, whomever you would like, in whatever way you would like, without being thrown in jail or oppressed or repressed, If you've got all of these things, consider yourself in the top tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of fortunate people. So we don't have to actually look very far to find things to be grateful for. Gratitude arises from an experience inside. My cup runneth over, my God. I am so blessed. And it can be little things. I mean, for me on a personal level, every single time I walk into the ashram, there's a view. When you walk into the ashram from the banks of Ganga, we've got this arch right in the center of the ashram, this beautiful colored, colorful arch with a little pointy thing at the top. And when you walk in in the daytime, in the light, Just behind that arch, what you see are all of the green mountains. And when you walk in in the evening, most of the year, what you see behind that arch is the moon. And whenever I walk in the ashram, day or evening, I look at that view and I think, my God, I can't believe I get to live here. I can't believe that I get to call this place my home. And it never gets old. It's been 26 years. And every time I see that. So you don't have to look very far. But what all of our, not just spirituality, but if you look today at science, if 
you look at psychology, if you look at the studies that are being done, the research that is being done, what it's all showing us is that gratitude produces happiness, not vice versa. First you become grateful, then you will be happy. And then something very interesting happens. Then you start getting what you want. It's really interesting. We become magnets of that which we want. There is a power in gratitude that somehow makes the energy of the universe stand up and take notice and support that. You know, if you've got someone in your life who just from the depths of their heart is so grateful day in and day out for your presence in their life, whatever you do, you're going to have an instinct to keep like doing things for them, right? I mean, if it's, if it's sincere, just effusive gratitude for who you are, whatever you do, Oh my God, thank you so much for that smile. That smile just made my day. Well, you're going to want to keep smiling at them. Not so that they keep saying thank you, but because we all, really at the end of the day, we all want to be seen. We want to be appreciated. We want our lives to make a difference. And if there's someone who minute after minute, day after day, just keeps appreciating you and telling you how much, how much your life matters to them. You're going to want to keep living near them. And I think in the same way, the universe, there's, there's just an energy around, okay, this person notices. This person is connected. Because think about it. I don't know if any of you have ever done this experiment. I sure have. Where you go out and you just decide you are going to smile at everybody that day. And you're going to try to make as many people smile as you can. If you've never done the experiment, I really recommend it. It's a beautiful, I mean, how you feel at the end of the day is so beautiful. But what you notice as you do it is, When someone smiles back, it brings a whole new level of inner joy. When nobody smiles at you, you have to keep generating the joy from inside yourself. You keep closing your eyes. You keep meditating again. You go within and you find within the source of joy that enables you to just keep smiling at people even when they ignore you or look like you're crazy. But when someone actually smiles back at you, it's it's a fuel, it's a catalyst to make you keep smiling. You're so much more ready to smile at the next person. And I think that the universe is, is kind of the same way. That like when we are in alignment with it, when we notice its gifts, we notice its grace. And we are grateful for it. There's an energy. And so to get what you want, first you become grateful. Sincerely, not as a means to an end, because guess what? The universe is pretty smart. It's actually inside your head as well. So you can't you can't outsmart the energy of the universe, because it hears your thoughts. So sincere gratitude for how your cup runneth over. And from that gratitude, joy blossoms. And in that joy, one of two things happens. Either you get the thing that you thought you wanted and it just 
moves into your already joyous space. Or you don't get it, but you realize that as it turns out, you didn't actually need it to be happy. And so you end up wanting what you have rather than trying to have what you want. And that's really the key to happiness, is not how do I get what I want, but how do I want what I have? So thank you is the best mantra. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. God is going to manifest in different ways for each of us based on our own characteristics, our own personalities, our own needs. What matters most to God is simply that we connect. And so based on how we think, based on our karma, based on our characteristics, we're going to experience God in different ways. Having a warm and fuzzy, expansive feeling in the heart is beautiful. And yeah, I, I feel that as well. But as many people as there are who connect with God, I think there's that many different experiences of what God is like. It's like... If you imagine in your family, say you've got three siblings and mother and father and some uncles and some aunts and some grandparents, you know, call it a relatively standard family. And you ask everyone in the family to describe mom. So you ask your dad to describe mom. Then you ask your brother or sister to describe mom. Then you ask your grandparents to describe mom. Everybody's going to describe her in different ways based on their relationship with her. So to your grandparents, she's their daughter. And they're going to have a completely different perspective on her. And therefore notice and recognize and appreciate different qualities of her than you and your siblings for whom she's your mom. Your your father, her husband, is going to have a completely different perspective on her. So if you say, how does thinking about mom make you feel? Well, everybody's going to feel differently. And that's only in one family, five or six or eight family members. Now you think God 
who's infinite, who could be who could be appearing to you in a temple, in a church, in a gurdwara, in a mosque. God could be appearing to you in the form of Krishna or Ram or Shiva, Durga or Christ or in the word through a Guru Granth Sahib through all of the different ways that all of the different religions connect with God, some with form, some without form, some with a spoken name, some without a spoken name. And of course, remember all of our indigenous traditions as well, for whom the divine manifests as spirit. A spirit that they feel and experience and worship through the elements. But God is infinite, so God is all of those. And in the same way that your your mom isn't going to care or have preference about who connects with her how, Think about it in another way. Think about it as a mother, but with four or five kids, different ages. And one kid, older one, says, Mom, the one a little bit, little bit younger says, Mommy, the one a little bit younger says, Ma or Mama. And the, the infant goes, Ma, ma, ma. <laughs> does she care? Does she, does she love one over the other? For the infant, she's a breast, right? If you could somehow get into that infant's head and say, what's your experience of mother? It would be a breast. But as we... As we grow, obviously our experience of mother changes. It's no longer just a breast. It becomes a lap. Then it becomes arms. Then it becomes an actual being, our, our, the one who cares for us. Then there's all kinds of relationship issues. And that's, that's one human being. Now you think about God infinite, with infinite number of relationships, with infinite numbers of beings, because I'm not convinced that humans are the only ones able to connect with God. Couldn't guarantee that other species can, but I also couldn't guarantee that they can't. So we have to assume at least the possibility that there's even more than the however many billions of humans have lived on earth, ways of connecting with God. But God, God doesn't seem to have a preference. However we connect with God, you know, Bhagwan Krishna says in the Gita, however the devotee worships me, I appear to the devotee in that form. So whether we're talking about a form of how we actually experience God or whether we're talking about how we feel God in our, in our beings. Yeah, I think feeling God in our heart is beautiful. That love of God, that presence of God's love, it's beautiful as we emphasize bhakti yoga and devotion, it's all about feeling God's love. But are there other ways to experience God? Of course. There's a lot of people for whom God isn't a being who actually loves us and who we love, so it's not such a heart connection. But it's just a presence an omnipresence, 
an infinite presence, this idea that there is nothing but God. And so there's an experience of just infinite spaciousness without even necessarily a quality that one would identify in the heart as love. And God is all of that. God is infinite, spaciousness, peace, expansion, love, truth. The mother, the father, the friend, as we chant in our mantras, you are everything. So however you connect to the divine, it's beautiful and it's correct. Ramakrishna Paramahansa, one of the greatest mystics, seers, sages, beings ever, did a personal experiment where he literally wanted to see whether he could, I mean, for him, he experienced God as the mother goddess, as Kali. But then he thought, well, she's infinite. Can I experience her through all these other traditions? And so he actually went out and he spent quite a bit of time Worshipping God as a Christian. Worshipping God as a Muslim. Worshipping God, I forget all of the different religions he did, but he chose several different religions and really went into their practices, their name, their language, like how they worship. And at the end of all of them, he was in the same place. One with his divine mother. And it was a beautiful experience for us through him to realize that for one who's so deeply connected to a particular aspect, a particular form, you could say, of the divine Kalima, that he was equally able to access her through worshiping Jesus Christ. And that it didn't matter which way he went in. But he got to the exact same place every time. So however you experience God, don't worry. It's all exactly right. It's all exactly perfect. The only thing that we always should try is can I experience God more? More in terms of frequency because most of us tend to experience God when we're really trying, in our meditation, in our prayers. Maybe if we're very fortunate, it happens spontaneously. There's just moments of our day and suddenly we're overcome with the presence of God. But there tend to be a lot of hours of our day where we are overcome with things other than God. And so I think the only prayer, rather than to experience God in some different way, would be to experience God more frequently. May I experience God through whatever I'm doing. Cooking food, doing the dishes, sweeping the floor, designing a website, driving a car, going grocery shopping, filing papers, singing a song, writing a book, reading a book. Balancing accounts. Whatever I'm doing. Can I experience God through that? So that as God is infinite, my experience of God may not be infinite, but at least it's something that covers and infuses as many of my daily moments and activities as possible. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. 
and I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio. Thank you.